Hello everyone, um, thank you for joining us for our workshop today. I am Yasmin, Yasmin KSU Student Affairs Officer, and today this is our third workshop in our series of organizations workshops, and today we'll be tackling applying for funds. Um, with us today, we have two speakers, um, Mr. Mauro Pajparas and Ms. Rebecca Zambit. Just to give you a brief introduction to the speakers which we have uh, with us today, Mr. Mauro Pajparas Candolo is the CEO of the Malta Council for the Voluntary Sector, the MCBS, and he has been the CEO of the MCBS since 2010. And uh, he is also a member of the Supervisory Council of the Malta Community Chest Fund Foundation and has been so since 2014. And today he will be tackling the first part of the workshop by, by um, tackling the topic of applying for national funds. Then for the second part of the workshop, we have with us today Ms. Rebecca Zammit, who is um, the EU funding executive at MUSAC. Her work involves assisting NGOs, local councils, schools, and public entities to develop and apply for EU-funded projects. And today she will be tackling the second part of the application by focusing on the workshop, sorry, by focusing on application writing and giving a specific focus on EU funding, on EU funding. And um, as uh, with regards to the, the event, the meeting will be recorded and just so you know, and we will be able to obviously share the recordings with you and presentations with you after after the meeting. As usual, please feel free to ask any questions which you may have during the meeting, during the event, by either switching on your microphones and asking the questions directly or by typing in the chat and we'll be able to answer your questions. Um, I hope that you find this workshop in, informative. I will go ahead and give the floor to Mr. Bashparas Kandalo so he can start off um, with, his, with his presentation. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Yasmin. I'm not sure if we need to actually have it, the presentation in Maltese or in English. For me, it's fine. There are, there are a couple of English-speaking um, individuals. So. Fine. So, so we'll do it in English. So, um, so thanks for having us. First of all, it's uh, it's nice to be working with uh, with KSU, but especially uh, knowing that there are a large number of volunteer organizations working on campus, uh, which obviously, obviously, over the years we've come to know one or the other. Um, the idea of today's meeting is to actually address three steps when it comes to to funding. Um, our remit as MCVS is more tied to local funding. So while Rebecca will be talking about EU funding, um, our remit as MCVS is dual. One, to actually be a fund operator ourselves. In fact, we, we manage a couple of funds, which um, all of them basically are suitable for um, university uh, organizations, student organizations, as well as we support organ other funding operators from other public entities to actually manage their own funding, which are at risk to the local volunteer organizations. So um, starting off immediately, um, let's make uh, the parameters clear when it comes to local funding. It is essential that any volunteer organization is enrolled with the commissioner. And this does not entail only the issue if you want to go for funding or not. This actually, as of uh, November 2018, when the uh, amendments to the Volunteer Organizations Act were put in place, th th there is an obligation um, that all organization, even if you do internal fundraising events or whatever, um, need to be enrolled the commissioner. So that is the uh, Punto de Partenza, the, the, the first issue that needs to be addressed by all um, student organizations that to actually uh, tap any type of funding you need to actually be registered and go with the commissioner for VOs. Um, if there are difficulties on that issue, uh, my office as Council for the Voluntary Sector, we are there as well to support in the issue of enrollment. Secondly, once that a volunteer organization is enrolled with the commissioner, it is important, and this sometimes has been an issue with um, student organizations for various reasons, to actually keep your compliance. When I say keep your compliance is that actually from day year to year, you have to see that the submissions, the annual returns, 
due to the commissioner for bills, uh, which are mainly the most important things, are the financial returns as well as the um, report, annual report of any organization, need to be submitted to the commissioner in time. Otherwise, when it comes to funding, even though an organization might be um, enrolled, may not be eligible at that point in time um, to actually receive funding. Okay? This sometimes happens, as you all may know, that in the issue of student organization, there they sometimes was difficulty of the issue of handover between one committee and the other. The successive um, follow-up from organization to the other is not always plain sailing, is not always clear. So when another organization committee, the new committee comes in to take over, there are things missing and they cannot actually comply with the commissioner's requests on, on the annual return. So it's important that each organization is clear on the issue of not only enrollment, but also of compliance. Today, um, mainly I will be introducing you to our main um, web page, web portal, which is the funding main portal. In fact, we will, I will not give actually showing you um, a presentation, but the actual, uh, I will share the screen Okay, so I, I think um, now the screen is accessible to all. Um, this is the VO funding portal. It's, it can be accessed directly from vofunding.org.mt. The idea of this portal was to actually have a one-stop shop for all the funding, uh, which is supported by public entities. In fact, if you go through most of these, apart from ours, you will see various ministries, um, entities, Agencia Zaza, Arts Council Malta, you name it, and most ministries, Foreign Affairs, Environmental Ministry. Um, so basically what we're going to do, and the, the idea of this portal itself was to actually have a one place where local funding is uh, concentrated, is focused, so that even for the sake of voluntary organizations, including the, the student organizations, you don't have actually to go jumping from one website to the other of, depending on the ministry or entity which is providing the, the, the particular type of funding. But from here, um, you will be alerted what is going on. In fact, if you see each fund is either declared open or still closed. Um, so through this funding portal, you will actually be alerted, um, depending obviously on which type of funding you are interested in, so that you will know when it's open or closed. This same uh, web portal is tied to a mobile app. Uh, the mobile app is VO Funding Malta, which app in itself is uh, accessible either Google or Apple Store. So you can actually download the, the app on your mobile. And the, the reason that the, FPL, the benefit of having the mobile app is that whenever any fund is opened or closed or even results come out, you will receive a notification on your uh, mobile app to be alerted depending on the interest in which um, particular uh, fund you're interested in. A step a little bit upwards um, the, on, on the screen. Over here on the left hand side, you will see either login or register. Um, all organizations can access w once. What I mean by once is um, each organization, um, even for security reasons, can um, apply to start using this portal. The idea is that any new organization which has never used this portal, simply go to register. It will bring um, up this template, which is the detail of the same organization, which details then will be verified backend by my team. Um, once you apply, you register, you will receive within 24 hours the acceptance to actually then log in 
for any application online. The reason for this is that um, the applications, each organization, you will make your own password, so it will be a secure system. So no other uh, administrator except for, for the team of your uh, own committee may know the password or may thus may access your online applications. This is a very secure system. We've been using it for the last four or five years. Okay, so each organization can then access um, it, the applications and do an online application. Moreover, with your login, you may also um, access your past application which were submitted under the system. So even the system as a backend will actually serve as your store sort of um, of application. So even as part of your handover from organization, from committee to committee, um, you can, they can simply access this and will see what uh, past applications were submitted by the same organizations. In fact, once you are then registered, you will simply um, be asked email and password, and you will log in and give an access to the online um, applications. I go back to the funding. Yasmin, I don't know if there are any questions at this stage. I don't think that there are any questions yet. Okay, fine. So, um, as you're seeing over here, there are some funds which are um, already open or still open. Okay, um, case in point, the Voluntary Organizations Emergency Fund is one of the funds we are managing in this particular time related to COVID issues. Um, even, so let's actually address fund by fund, not going through them, but the way we actually have the funds online. Um, once you're interested in a particular fund, each fund, once you actually open the particular page, um, you will have the main um, ideas, the aims and objectives of the fund. So immediately through there, you will see if the fund, particular fund is of interest to your organization. For further details, each fund on this website has its own guidelines. So, so technically you have the details of what type of funding um, you can apply for, um, what are the funds, the amounts of the funding, etc. So if you go to the fund, the particular fund, you will actually see um, the details of the same fund. So back to the main page, even for the application, I can go as a sample, log in once the application is open, you will simply have uh, the login um, once you apply. Just give me a second. Okay. So, as you will see, most applications across the board, ir irrelevant of which type of fund, are actually distributed in, 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 in this manner. So whenever you go to an application which, which is open, which is an active application, the system actually takes you page by page and they are quite straightforward and I believe they are very much user friendly. So for each area, you just have page by page and once you actually um, go through the page, fill in the necessary requirements, you simply press validate and save changes, okay? And you can literally, switch off the computer and continue the application tomorrow. So the idea of this application is, is that it saves backend uh, the application. Once, okay, you actually go through the, all the pages and you have filled in correctly and validated. Uh, if you go to the last page right now in the declaration, as of now, you, you will not see the, the press send button, okay? The idea is that the application itself will not have the send button appear before you actually fill the application duly, completely. Okay, so it, it will actually help you not to send the half-baked application or with missing information. So once you have all the pages filled in and validate and saved each page, 
in the last page, a send button will appear. Once you press the send button, we will receive immediately the application and you will receive an online um, receipt, an online notification by email that the application actually has gone through. So uh, all the funds um, are similar in, in the same, in, in the fact that they are, as regards layout, they are similarly laid. When it comes to closed applications, I go to something which actually will be of interest, obviously, even to um, your organizations. Right now, for example, the volunteer organizations project scheme is uh, still closed. So as you can see, application closed. So the application button does not appear for now. This particular fund, which supports funding um, of up to 20,000 euros, supports various areas of funding. This supports um, both uh, aspects of project funding, it supports as well infrastructural funding, and it supports research. Okay, so anyone interested, there are the guidelines already in place for the upcoming fund, uh, which call will open next Monday. It, it will open on the 12th uh, of October, okay? Similar to this fund, but with um, lesser uh, funding support, which is a smaller fund, is the Small Initiative Support Scheme, which um, will be open tomorrow morning. So technically, the application will be online uh, tomorrow. It supports 100% projects up to 3,000 euros in whichever area or type of project. It's specifically for uh, project-based. So basically, you can actually, as from tomorrow, we will have the application online. But as you see, the SIS guidelines are already online, and you can actually access them to see the priorities uh, of the fund and even aims and objectives. That will guide you um, to the application. It would be interesting, should you wish to actually see what happened last year, um, we always, even for the sake of transparency, on our funding areas, we always put the results of the past year. So even you will have a list of the organizations which benefited both from SIS and VOPS uh, and the, even the short name and description of the particular project. So it will give you an idea of what type of projects are, are normally successful um, under the, um, these funding lines. Another fund which, uh, when it comes to young um, students, okay, is addressed and is managed by, by us as well, is the Youth Voluntary Work Scheme. Um, the scope of the Youth Voluntary Work Scheme is sort of um, an initiative to support young people to um, have placements within voluntary organizations for a brief period, periods up to six months, um, where they are actually given um, sort of a pocket money for their work within an organization. So if you go interested in the scheme, uh, both for yourselves as students, but also for um, persons who may be interested, this scheme um, does not have actually a closing date, it's open all year round. Um, so anyone can apply anytime to be placed with an organization. Um, one has to actually find the organization and that will act as host. This uh, funding line, the youth scheme, also supports, up till now, even mobility of young people going uh, for an experience uh, abroad, okay? And it supports up to 2,500 euros um, for countries which are not EU countries. So the intention of this fund was to complement the already existing mobilities um, under Erasmus um, in, in the youth area, okay? And that area, obviously, will be the remit then of Rebecca to actually discuss on the issue of uh, EU funding. It also complements, and this is when, where we're seeing even the future of the youth voluntary work scheme when it comes to the European and international support, because now we have as well, for the last year or so, the European Solidarity Corps, in that which supports similar funding, and we are looking into the possibility of 
having this fund, the Youth Voluntary Works Team, focus on the local support and complements the European Solidarity Corps um, funding, which then will be fully taken care of for the international mobility. The next one uh, next to the youth scheme is the training initiative scheme, which uh, unfortunately uh, will be closing this Friday, so it's very short notice for this, uh, for this seminar. But the idea of the training initiative scheme is to actually have twofold. One, uh, it supports individuals who wish to go for training, both local and abroad, and there, it supports um, individuals coming from volunteer organizations who go for a training course, training seminar, and it supports both the mobility abroad as well as the conference fees, etc., uh, up to a maximum of 2,500 as well. And it supports as well, and this might be useful for university organizations, for training undertaken by the organization itself. So if you wish to organize a training conference, a training seminar, in whatever model, right now, because of the COVID, we are not actually doing much training face-to-face, um, -face, but even online. But this type of training supports potentially even training online, uh, facilities needed to actually have the training online, as well as you may have speakers who are not uh, uh, only local, but even foreigners, who can actually be supported even financially to actually participate in such training sessions online. Um, so the training initiative scheme is uh, for sure uh, a valid uh, funding support even for uh, student organizations. Then obviously there are the other various um, funding lines, which especially those obviously are from Agencia Zaza, uh, Arts Council may be of interest on the, depending, yes, on a general basis, Agencia Zaza for most organizations, um, but also the others depending on even the specialty of the faculty of the group of uh, or our students. Last from our funds and not least is the civil society fund. And this, in a way, um, organizations are in time to actually apply for this because the scope of civil society fund is that it supports up to 6,000 euros a year per organization for the scope of organizations participating in EU fora. So if an organization, a student body, wishes to participate in a European forum, a European forum where they actually either be it physical or now remotely, and this can support funding of mobilities or other ways of actually now doing uh, and participating in the conferences that you still may be joining the European forum, European conferences and having to pay the participation fees. So th those are as well eligible under this uh, funding line, the Civil Society Fund. Um, the, the difference between this and most of the other funding is that instead of having to apply for the fund, then once you get the funds, you can execute the project or the mobility. On the contrary, uh, the Civil Society Fund will now open next um, June, June 2021, and it will be, um, the eligible costs will be for any type of training, mobility, participation at Euphora, which you incur between the 1st of July of this year, 2021, up till the end of June of 20, sorry, 1st of July, 2020, up till next year, end of June, 2021. So any, uh, any type of participation, from now till the end of June of next year would be an eligible cost to, to then ask reimbursement under um, the scheme. So this works, sorry, Mauro, so this works sort of like a, a refund, on a refund basis. A exactly. Refund basis. And it applies to any conference and in, in, in a European group, which, which the, the, the organization would, would attend. Exactly. In fact, as, as you are saying, well, um, it is a, a sort of retroactive payment. The, the mobility or the participation has to have been incurred in the period 
stipulated. Then next June, we issue the calls for any mobilities or participation which have taken place the year before, which is um, 1st July 2020 till end of June 2021. And they will be eligible to a maximum of 6,000 euros per organization. And okay. are there any, any specific um, um, specific requirements for, for organizations to be eligible for the fund? Or is it is it um, just so so the the, ba the basic requirement is as all funding that they are enrolled and compliant with the commissioner. But otherwise, specifically for this fund, it is that the, the, the forum or the the conference or whatever is organized by a European body. So when we say a European body, it is not um, your counterpart of organization, which is the Italian counterpart. The Italians are Europeans, yes, but they are not a European body, they are a national body. So what when we say European body, it has to be the European Association of Vietnam, um, physiotherapy students, okay? But the body itself has to be um, a European representation, not a national, So, to, and then it becomes a one-to-one. -one. It, it, it will be a one-to-one -one Malta Italy or Malta Germany interaction. It has to be the body which represents the particular group of VOs in a particular field at European level. Um, something I wish to actually, um, when I go, if I, I, I'm going back and the idea is going back to the, our main website, the, the MCVS, not the VO funding portal, you will find um, in the contact list over, over here, um, just a second until, In the contact list, you, you will see um, the fund officers. Basically over here, um, each fund officer, the funds I've mentioned when it, when it comes to funds managed by MCVS are all here. So um, you have Rachel Muscat, which is responsible for the Volunteer Organization Project Scheme, Rebecca Pisani for the Civil Society Fund, which we just talked about, Glenn Kirkop for the Small Initiative Support Scheme, and Annabella Apart for the Youth Volunteer Work Scheme. The reason I'm showing you this because uh, obviously, then when, some, when an organization wants to go to detail of the specifics, apart from going into the particular guidelines of um, the, sa the same fund, as, as I said, each funding line has its guideline updated on, on, the, on the website. Um, it would be uh, ideal to have either a remote meeting or talk with the officer responsible and any organization, um, depending on the question, one has can put forward the actual um, question or bounce back any ideas, even on projects, on especially the VOP census, the idea of projects which one may actually put under the various funding lines for eligibility purposes. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions, Yasmin, on... Um, may I ask a question, please? Yes, of course. Um, is the, you're mentioning a lot of schemes and a lot of funds for various things, or not, yep. not only as in speaking from MMSA sides, and I think all the other organizations sort of, we branch out a lot, so we can apply for more than one fund. Yes, is of there, course. Is there a limit on how much, as in, we can, how many, Grants you can apply for, or money-wise, Manoj? No, money-wise, in fact, MMSA, uh, we've worked with MMSA in the past, especially, I, I remember um, you were successful in this, obviously, um, the committees before you, I'm talking about three, four years back. Um, but no, there is no limit when it comes to funds, okay? The, the only limit most funds have is that you can only submit one application per deadline. So as an MSA, you cannot actually submit two applications under VOPs, but there is nothing against you submitting under the VOPs, the CIS, Civil Society Fund, one under each. 
So technically, as long as you have the internal capacity to manage the funds, um, there is no issue when it comes to funding on having more than one particular fund um, at a time. Okay, so obviously be aware of your capacity. That's very crucial. Um, but otherwise, you can apply for funds uh, more than one at, at a go. Obviously, keeping also in mind not to, and that is something I, 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 I wish to say, that we are very aware of potential double funding. Okay, so it's important that when you apply for a particular fund, the same fund, the, the same project is not replicated under another fund because one of the, let's say, transparent things we have applied under this particular system, even cooperation between the various fund operators, that um, there is cross-sectoral information about between the fund operators to see that we are not funding the same project more than once. Okay, so we need to be careful. I'm not saying this is done purposely, but beware of not having a case of double funding. And this applies as well to potential local uh, projects while having a new project. So the issue of double funding is very much on the agenda of when we are monitoring and auditing um, ongoing projects. Not sure if you have any other questions. Um, yes, hi. Uh, so I'm from MHSA. Um, I wanted to ask because uh, uh, by word of mouth, when we called to the office of the BO, um, we were notified that a compliance certificate was, I mean, we were found to be compliant, but okay. we have not received the certificate as of yet. And I don't, I don't know exactly whether it would be <laughs> whether I, if we filled out an application, it would go through and we would get the funding or not, or, uh, or yeah, uh, even once, once for your own sake, you, you know you are compliant and you have confirmed with the office of the commissioner, which is an independent office from my office, that your organization is in line and compliant even though you have nothing in hand, most, all applications, we don't actually request on application a compliance certificate because the way we operate is that once uh, we issue a call on the deadline, on the last day, when actually all the applications um, are in, one of the team actually sends the full list, let's say of VOPs, okay, to the office of the commissioner and we have verification of all the, let's say, 80 applications in, if the organization is compliant or not. Okay, so we, we have our own systems, obviously, and we check also on behalf of the other operators as well with the commissioner to verify that those who actually have applied are compliant. In fact, at that point, any applications of volunteer organizations which are confirmed by the commissioner, which are not compliant, will not even go for evaluation. Okay, the application stops there and this considered ineligible. If the commissioner informs any fund operator that the organization is non-compliant at that point in time. Okay, so one may actually be late or whatever in the application, but be, be assured on your side that once you actually, there is an open call, like we mentioned, VOPS is opening next week and you intend to apply while you are working on the application, verify with the commissioner that you ha don't have anything missing um, with the, the office of the commissioner. So once we actually, at the end of the closing date, we verify your organization, your organization is deemed to be compliant. There will be no issues. Any other questions? Okay. So, Yasmin, um, I'm not sure if you have any questions from your side on a, on a general perspective. Um, I don't have any questions from my end. I think that it's important for everyone, as we said, to just keep an eye out on the, on the BO funding portal so that they can stay updated as to when um, funds open, etc. But as in, if no one else has, yet, has any other questions, as in, I think it was very clear. 
I have a okay. question, actually, if possible. Yes, of course. Hi, so I'm, I'm Alex. I'm from USPA, which is the School of Performing Arts Association. Um, you mentioned before kind of the different entities make sure that um, people don't receive double funds. Um, in terms of arts organizations, that, does that also refer to, for example, arts council funds? Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, from our side, as, as, you, as you can see, even though the applications for the arts council funds are uh, basically on, on their own website as well. But you will see that um, most of the okay. funding lines are here. In fact, uh, here there's the theater spaces, which we actually support with information. And then in the page, we have a link to the Arts Council Malta. And we have, yes, a very close relation with Arts Council Malta, with Simone Inguanes and her team. Um, so we actually, uh, yes, verify and cross-reference any funds and uh, applications coming in so that we are not supporting the same project not the same organizations that's fine mm -hmm. but the same project that's the issue of double funding but uh, it is important that from our side we actually uh, have a good working relation with other fund operators okay thank you so maybe, yes min maybe as a last um, question as a last yeah. question um i know that there are usually um specific months when the funds when most of the funds open um it might be that there are different different months for for some specific funds but um would you be able to give us a bit more information with regards to that and so the deadline the opening date and the deadlines so um no normally um most uh, funds open in this period, even though this year cannot be considered as a normal year. So some funds fell a bit backwards on, the, uh, on their call, because ideally we normally issue around about September, October to be in time to actually um, evaluate the applications by the end of year, because then we actually support projects for the next, the upcoming uh, calendar year. But there are a lot of um, applications. I know that Agencia Zaza issues some of its calls um, right now, but there are other three calls which Agencia Zaza issues around about April. Something that we will be actually doing for next year, 2021, is that we will be having, and I'm asking all the fund operators to cooperate on this, we will be having a one place calendar where you will actually see from January till December, all the funds listed in this uh, funding portal, the tar their target um, opening. Okay, so that one can actually be aware, plan, discuss internally within one's committee um, to actually prepare for the projects. Okay, so the ideal would be that by the end of this year, um, we will be having an online calendar of funds. So it, it will facilitate your planning, especially as student organizations, but any volunteer organization on next year's uh, funds. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another so, question. By yes, of course. Ivana Dalia. Uh, hi, uh, as a, so I'm from Vitasai. Uh, I would like to ask, would we be aware if you weren't compliant anymore? Would we be sent like an email or a letter that something happened? No, you, you will not be informed that you are not compliant by the commission. The, the reason is that compliance in itself is very fluid. You may be compliant right now because you have submitted all the documentation. Okay. And come beginning first quarter of next year, you will not be compliant because then you will have the next deadline, which is normally for small organization, end of March 2021. You fall back on your obligations of submission of documentations and you become non compliant. Okay, so technically, you will actually know your position as an organization year by year. So most small organizations, and that applies for almost across the board for university students organizations, have to submit with the commissioner, with obviously the exception of this year, where the commissioner gave an extension to end of September to everyone. Okay, but now everyone is overdue. Anyone who has not submitted for 2019 as yet is non-compliant. 
okay? But technically speaking, each year for the previous year, an organization, which is a small organization under turnover of 50,000 euros, has to submit its uh, documentation by March of the next year. So any organization that by March 2021 does not submit to the commissioner its uh, documentation, financial and uh, annual report, will be non-compliant. So technically, you will know uh, your position. For us, we verify depending on when the, the fund comes out. So for me, if um, VOX closes on the 12th of November, oh, no, sorry, on the 20th of November, it will be closing on the 20th of November. On the 20th, we will send, be sending the list for uh, status at that point in time to verify compliance. So any organizations who have not come to terms with the financial year 2019 as yet will be declared non-compliant. I think okay. it's really wise to sort of check with regards to your status as an organization with the with the with the uh, commissioner before submitting your application. I, I, I would recommend that. So before um, I actually finish my presentation, just two information points, which obviously as organizations and organizations will be helpful um, to the organization. I, first of all, have to remind you of the mobile app, which I recommend that um, you being all actually um, very much friendly with the mobile situation more than my age group, um, have the mobile app installed so that you will be aware when they come out applications online. It is the VO funding Malta, um, which you can install. Apart from that, um, as MCVS, on all the funding and whatever news comes out, we have a system of must mail. We actually have more than 1,800 organizations on our list, which are those enrolled with the commissioner. Each organization gives us more than two or three email addresses. So we have a mailing list of over 6,000 um, organizations. So if you don't receive, as enrolled organizations, um, mass mail from us, from MZFES, okay, information regarding anything, funds, um, training, or whatever, simply contact our offices and verify your organization's email. Because sometimes um, your organization or an organization has an old email which no one uses anymore or no one knows about anymore, okay, and you are not receiving this information. So it is important that if you're not receiving any mass mail from us, um, kindly contact our offices. It's 2248-1110. Um, you will find it on our website as well um, and any contact numbers. And uh, check and you may give us even more emails. So if there is only one email of someone and you need to add two emails or whatever, we'll happily include that so that you will be receiving um, information duly and on, on the time they come out. Okay, from my side, Yasmin and everyone, Rebecca, um, I think uh, uh, that's all for tonight. And if you need anything, feel free, both um, Yasmin from your side as KSU, um, we have an open door policy. So anytime you, you require anything, just contact us. And even my team, um, we are basically uh, happy to, ha to help any organization. Okay, so for now, I think um, thank you for this opportunity and wish you all luck on, on your funding opportunities. Thank you so much for your Thank you so much for your support. Sorry, you had some difficulties. Um, thank you so much for your time and for for being with us today. Um, and thank you for your presentation. I think that was very helpful Perfect. and informative. Um, I will now pass on the, the floor to, to Rebecca, who will be obviously be um, tackling the, the topic of applying for, for EU funding. And she will be focusing more generally on, on the actual application writing. So what goes in into application writing, both for national and EU funds. So what are the criteria that you usually, that usually are looked out for and what you need to do, what processes you need to follow. So um, I will now give the floor to Rebecca. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yasmin, and uh, thank you, KSU in general, for organizing this workshop and inviting MUSEC to uh, 
to give this presentation today. Um, just as a general introduction before I start, um, I, my name is Jirba Kazamit, obviously. Um, I graduated from uh, university two years ago, so uh, not that long ago. And actually during my time uh, at university, I was also part of a student organization myself. I spent two years in Jeff Malta, and that's actually how I got to know MUSEC initially, because uh, when I was uh, in Jeff, we had contacted uh, uh, MUSEC for assistance to apply for EU funds. And uh, since then, since 2016, uh, Jeff Malta has successfully applied every year through MUSEC assistance. So um, that's how um, the whole story started for me um, on a personal level. So today I will be giving you, as uh, Yasmin said, an information session specifically for EU funds for uh, student organizations and also going into some detail on student organizations. Um, before I start, um, as previously, please keep your microphones and audio muted as you have, unless you're asking a question. Um, you can ask questions uh, at any point on chat. I will get to them um, uh, during the designated question times. Um, um, uh, there's also a colleague of mine, uh, Lynn Spiteri, um, present here uh, in this Zoom session. She may be, she may be um, intervening to, to facilitate questions at some point um, if it's needed. Uh, and uh, it's, that's it uh, in terms of the general rules to follow. So as a general agenda, we will be going into what MUSEC is and then EU funds uh, very, briefly, very briefly and then going into the general process of uh, writing an application. Um, just for you to know, um, it's not what, what I will be going into in terms of writing an application. It's not exclusively for EU funds. You will also be able to translate uh, what I will be telling you to local funds, um, to any application for funding, essentially. So uh, what is MUSEC? Uh, we are a government agency with three main roles, um, EU policy and legislation, communication and events in relation to European affairs and also EU funding, which is the team uh, that I make part of. Um, when it comes to how we can assist you as NGOs and any other public uh, entity, uh, we hold information sessions similar to this one where we give information on uh, particular programs available um, for, for funding. We also hold capacity building sessions, which are uh, mainly related to project development and project writing. So uh, a bit similar to what we're doing here today, but um, more in detail and a bit longer uh, because today is a bit of a condensed session to fit into the timeframes. We also hold one-to-one -one meetings and this is something I very much encourage you to do if you're interested in EU funds. We sit down with you either virtually or in person at our offices. We discuss what your organization um, is, what it wants to do, if it has any particular ideas and we help match you to one of the eligible funding uh, programs if it is possible. Um, beyond that, we go one step further. So we help you develop projects that are both eligible and competitive because EU funding applications are a competition at the end of the day. So we help you make sure that your project is as good as it can be. And ultimately, we also offer the assistance to, in writing, actually writing the application since we do not actually give funds ourselves, we are able to um, enter into your application, help you write in certain sections, or if you prefer, you can write it completely yourself and um, send it to us and we can uh, vet it. We basically read it as an external evaluator would, and we would give you uh, feedback and pointers for, um, for the improvement of your project. And every one of these services are free of charge uh, since we're a government entity as well. Our aim in this particular session is to help you develop your project writing skills and build the capacity of you as organizations to be able to submit strong project proposals. Again, keeping in mind that EU funds are, um, at the end of the day, a, a competitive process. Now, our methodology today, um, I will be giving you a very brief introduction on what EU funds um, there, there are for student organizations in particular. I've selected um, a selection of of opportunities that I think are most um, eligible for you, most relevant for you. Then I'm uh, going into project uh, writing and a step-by-step -step approach. So at any uh, stage of the project writing um, process, 
Um, again, we have question times, um, designated question times throughout the presentation, but if you have any question and you don't want to wait, you can write it in the chat. We will be sending you through KSU a notes pack, so this presentation won't be given to you um, uh, as, as a PowerPoint, but we have prepared a notes pack that is actually much more detailed in terms of content than the PowerPoint because the PowerPoint is more visual based, so you can uh, not worry about taking notes. Um, you can just uh, listen and engage for now. You will be receiving the notes afterwards. And we have also prepared a sample application form. Uh, now this we have done because we've, we've received a lot of questions over the years for uh, people asking if they can see um, a successful filled in application form. We cannot do that because obviously that's um, a breach of GDPR. But uh, what we have done so that you can still have an idea of what an, an application form looks like, what answers need to look like. We have made up a fake um, project, we have made up a fake organization, a fake application essentially, filled it in um, so that you can read through it and understand uh, the, the practice behind the theory that I will be giving you today. So, uh, so far, are there any questions? All right. Um, Okay, so um, EU funds for student organizations. I won't be going into too much detail here um, for several reasons. First of all, there are no more deadlines um, this year. The, the deadlines for what I will be telling you are normally in February, April and October. So um, it's just past the, the, the deadline. So there's no need to go into too much detail at this stage. Um, apart from this, we are towards the end of the EU um, funding program, so 2014-2020, it's um, ending this year, and starting next year, there will be new programs um, for all EU funds. So um, it is a bit futile to go into specific eligibility criteria at this stage, because um, come, come next year, these uh, details may change. That being said, I st um, and in discussion with KSU, we still wanted to give you an idea of what's out there, so that even you may start planning um, in advance and you may even set up a meeting um, from now so that we start discussing what a potential project could look like. So the first um, funding opportunity and the most easy and it tends to be the most popular one as well. Um, it's the Erasmus Plus Key Action One Youth Exchange. Um, in its basic terms, it's when a group of youths from at least two different countries in, uh, in, the, pro in the eligible countries in the program guide meet to carry out a program of activities that you yourself um, design. So you would need a partner organization. And uh, very importantly, this needs to be, um, the exchange needs to be structured around some sort of topic, uh, typically some topic of social relevance like climate change or civic education, these sort of things. And it needs to be focused on hands-on non-formal learning. What we mean by this is that it is it cannot be that um, it's a group of youth sitting down and listening to a lecturer speak like you do um, in your lectures these must uh, youths must learn by doing so workshops debates treasure hunts discussions these sort of activities are what is looked for in in a youth exchange so uh, and in terms of age range uh, you would be able to have participants between 13 to 30 years old Next is the Erasmus Plus Key Action 1 VET Mobility Project. VET stands for Vocation, Education and Training. Now, um, in uh, the, the interpretation that is given by the Managing Authority by UPA here is that you would be a VET organization if your organization provides some sort of hands-on training to your members. So I know there are uh, organizations that are directly involved in providing placements or organization, organizing internships, but beyond that, if your organization organizes workshops for your members, um, either related to your faculty, like I know the medical organizations do um, every year, or even just workshops to your members to, to give public speaking, speaking skills, for example, that is hands-on training. So that would qualify you as a VET organization. What's good about this particular um, opportunity is that it allows you to send either your learners, so your members, or your staff, um, your, your members of the executive boards to receive training at a receiving partner organization abroad. Now in the current program, training was considered to be exclusively job shadowing or observation. So you would have been able to send 
um, your members to uh, um, an organization abroad. This could have been, for example, one of those European um, groupings that um, all of you, most of you are part of. But uh, we have indications that starting from next year, uh, you will also be able to participate in structured courses either abroad or to bring the trainer here in Malta to give training to your organization, which obviously opens up a lot of doors. Um, another opportunity is the Erasmus Plus Key Action to Transnational Youth Initiative. Now, this is a step further than the Key Action 1 and a bit more complex. So if you've never looked at um, European funds before, I would suggest that you uh, first consider something um, uh, less complex than this that being said um, it's still something that you could that you could look into because it's very broad and therefore allows you to do a, a lot of things so it's basically for organizations across the eu to develop networks with each other to have them be more europeanized to share ideas and best practices with each other and to foster the social commitment of youths so as student organizations basically everything you do fosters social commitment of youths because you are yourselves youth volunteers um, so anything that you would need um, partnership abroad to carry out maybe you've uh, you want to do some sort of transnational uh, civic action or an artistic or cultural initiative or an action um, that benefits the local community such as something related to the environment for example um, anything like this um, would be um, able to fit into a transnational youth initiative. So that's something you could also uh, keep in mind. Um, the last of the Erasmus Plus opportunities is the Key Action Tree Youth Dialogue. These are projects that promote the active participation of youths in the democratic life um, of, of the country. Um, ultimately, they must lead to interaction with decision makers. So the aim here is to give youths a voice um, so that they meet with decision makers and discuss um, issues of national relevance or of European relevance, uh, sorry. This project can be um, national or transnational. So for the first time here, we have a project that you do not need a partner. You do not exclusively need a partner to carry out. So if you're interested in doing something purely national, this would be a good idea. The type of activities you would be able to do, for example, are debates or political simulations, conferences, consultations, and ultimately, they must result in policy proposals by youths that you would be able to present to decision makers um, at the end of the project. Uh, the, the last um, opportunity that I will be going into today is the European Solidarity Corps, specifically the Solidarity Project. Here, this is also a national project, and it allows a minimum of five youths to identify a problem in their community and come up with a project that would address this particular problem. So um, this could be anything like uh, environmental uh, degradation or problems with relation to minority group groups. So these sort of uh, social um, issues. And um, here, an organization, it cannot um, technically carry it out itself. What it can do is apply on behalf of this group of youths that it is supporting and give them administrative financial assistance, um, help them um, in some specific tasks. So what you could do here is uh, find an, um, a group of uh, your members and assist them in, in applying for a solidarity project. Um, so um, after going through very quickly and very briefly on what opportunities are most suitable for student organizations, I did want to take um, a minute or two to emphasize why you should look into them um, first of all, the Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps are the most accessible when it comes to EU funds. So um, they're the easiest to apply for and the easiest to implement. I'm not saying they're a walk in the park exactly, but they are they are made for youths. So they are very um, doable in a sense. So um, if you um, you have your mindset on it, it's it's quite it's relatively easy to carry them out. They are flexible in nature. So as you can see, um, there's um, all of you present are come from different fields. Some of you are faculty based. Some of you um, are more focused on a specific topic. Some of you are arts related. And any one of you, um, if you wanted to, we would be able to find a way to fit an idea, to fit a project under any one of the strands that I mentioned um, previously. So in that uh, respect, they are quite flexible. Um, also, the way that they work is based on a lump sum system. What it means is uh, um, 
you don't actually provide a budget for them when you apply. So you don't tell them I need 15,000 euros, for example. What you do instead is that you input um, certain considerations like the number of participants you will be having, um, whether there is any travel involved, um, the number of months sometimes of a project, and the system, the application automatically calculates all of these factors and gives you uh, an amount um, based on uh, your, your project. And you have that, that 10,000 euro grant, for example, and you need to carry out your project um, with this 10,000 euros. It is, it, there is no co-financing element. Some EU funds work um, like, like the local funds that um, Mauro went, went over um, previously. You would, some of them have a co-financing element. So um, if the total project costs 10,000 euros, you would only receive, for example, 80% of them, and you would need to fork out the other 20%. Um, these particular funds that I covered do not work like that. So if your project costs 10,000, that is the money you will be receiving based on the, the allocations already established in the program guides. Um, however, keep in mind that you, um, there is a system of uh, pre-financing. So what this means is uh, um, they give you 80%, normally it's 80% of the, to of the total grant um, before you start. So you have money to actually carry it out um, throughout the, the project. However, they keep on to a percentage, normally 20%, and they only give it to you after you submit your final report. So this is sort of um, their way of ensuring that you're going to carry out the project um, as you should. Um, so um, keep in mind that you would need some, some a buffer amount um, in your bank accounts to be able to um, keep going until you receive that final 20%. Also, there are multiple annual deadlines. I mentioned before there are uh, deadlines in early February, late April, and early October. That being said, this may change in the, slightly in the next program period, um, but typically this is the deadlines. And for suit organizations, um, this is very beneficial because uh, for February, you will probably have exams unless they, sh they shift the, 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 on, given the current situation. In April, there are a lot of you who have elections ongoing or a board is still um, getting established, so it's not the ideal time. Um, so you can pick and choose the deadline that makes most sense for your organization. And on a personal note, I can guarantee you that it is a really, really uh, amazing personal and organizational learning experience. So having um, Erasmus Plus European Solidarity Corps project management on your CV is something that um, both employers and even universities, if you're applying for master's programs, for example, they uh, look very, very favorably upon them. And uh, also as an organization, I uh, watched uh, my organization at the time grow exponentially because of EU funds. We could do things that we couldn't do otherwise. We got to reach new people. We got to meet um, more policymakers. So I do very highly encourage that you at least look into the possibility. So any questions up till now? We've covered um, the EU funds opportunities portion of the, the presentation. I don't seem to be any questions. Right. So so I, I'm not able to see the chat, so you will need to let me know. Um, so getting started when it comes to applying for EU funds, um, the first thing you need to do before you actually sit down and start writing your application is check if um, you have an EU login account for your organization. If in the past, even two, three, four years ago, you did apply for for um, some sort of EU funds, even if you didn't have, uh, if it wasn't successful, you will have a, a login account. So it's just a case of finding the login details um, in this case, um, because the application form is online. If you do not have the, the EU login account, it's a relatively simple process. You just create an account like you would for anything else and uh, provide some details and some documents um, to support um, your, your registration. Then um, the next step would be to access the application and program guide for both um, European Solidarity Corps and Erasmus Plus. Um, in both cases, this would be found on the European Union Programs Agency website, the UPA website. This is the managing authority of, uh, of both projects. So um, you would be able to click on the tabs relevant to your um, specific project. 
it's important that you access the program guide before you start writing your application because your program guide tells you exactly what you um, should be doing in terms of a project. So um, this program guide will tell you what the scope of the project needs to be, um, the type of eligible activities, um, who can apply, who can participate, the amount of partners you would need, um, the award criteria, which is also always important to keep in mind. Um, um, and if you do not read the program guide carefully, it is very easy to um, present a project that is, is either not eligible or not competitive. So um, do make sure to read these and understand them. If you do not understand what the program guide says, um, contact us. We would be able to help assist you either over a phone call or through a meeting. Um, so you can do that at any time. Now, the next step and something that is typically quite overlooked, but I do, I do very highly recommend that you don't uh, skip this step, is write a project brief. Um, basically, a project brief is just a summary of your project. You sit down and you write down the aims, the objectives, the activities, the target groups, the expected results, these key factors. By the way, I'll be going into what each of these um, categories here are. And you, sit, you help yourself formulate the project and ensure that it is structured and holistic. Um, this will facilitate the writing process, make it faster because uh, you're already familiar with what your project is before you start writing. Because if you skip this step, you would start writing in your application and it's quite typical that in the middle of it, you realize that something doesn't make sense or you overlooked um, one of uh, the activities. So you would need to go back, rewrite, and it takes a lot of time. Um, also, a project brief helps you in the next step, which is to set up a project partnership if you need one. Um, so first of all, you must have partners if the, the project necessitates that you have a partnership. You make sure that your partners are eligible um, based in eligible countries and that they are according to the minimum and maximum requirements. Uh, besides this, what uh, I mentioned the project brief here, because when it comes to finding a partnership, it is easier to find a partnership if you already have at least a good idea of what your project is going to be. Because then it's easier to go up to an organization abroad and tell them we have this idea, um, here is the project brief, would you be interested, as opposed to having to contact them, sitting, telling them maybe we, should, we can work together to figure out a project. It's always easier if you at least have a basis to, to present to others. Um, any questions on uh, the, the beginning, the, the initial aspects of project writing? So maybe could you just give us a brief, 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 um, not even an explanation, just some examples of the usual projects which are submitted and successful for, for such funds, just a general idea of the types of activities that they would involve? Well, that depends really on the on the specific uh, funding of the funding strands. So let's quickly go back and I can go over a few of them. Um, youth exchanges, it's such um, a vast funding strand that essentially anything that you uh, you want to do with relation to a social topic. So let's say you, you are um, an organization that deals with um, European affairs. I'm going to stick to that because that's my background. Um, so you find a partner abroad, um, let's say Italy, and you come up with a week's or a week long activity program um, to, uh, to improve the competences of your members when it comes to civic, uh, to civic participation in European affairs. So we have um, public speaking, you have um, debating, you have presentation skills, you would also you can also have something related to policy. Um, you could have um, you, you could go further in, in, in terms of topics. You would go in to educate to environment, to uh, minority groups, um, issues in relation to integration. It's you can do a lot of things with a youth exchange. What's important is that you have a program of activities that is based on non-formal learning. Um, and again, if you um, are not sure whether you your idea would fit into a youth exchange, feel free to contact us at any time and we would set up a meeting. In terms of VET mobility project, what you can do very easily, for example, is if you are, um, let's say a medical uh, student organization, 
and you are part of a European grouping or you have contacts or links or you are able to make links, a connection with some sort of um, similar organization abroad, um, it doesn't even have to be an NGO. This can be anything from, um, from a company to a university, basically any public and private organization that, is, um, that works in VET, so in vocation, education and training. And you would be able to go for a week or two and observe them. Um, so I'm going to speak in terms of job shadowing because that's what was eligible in this funding program. Um, you would be able to observe what this company does, for example, on a day-to-day -day basis, or you could go to a similar NGO if you want to send your exec members to see how that NGO is more effective when it comes to social media reach, for example, or when it comes to um, awareness campaigns, um, they're more effective than you, so you want to learn what they do. This is what you are, that what something you can do with a VET mobility project. Um, this is a very, a very broad um, funding strand again, so you can do pretty much um, whatever you set your mind to as long as it's eligible. Um, I'm not sure if I've covered, again, um, the, there are a lot of them, so I can't really go into detail of what each um, funding strand looks for in terms of a successful application and in terms of a successful project, but uh, rest assured when it comes to student organizations, there is a lot of untapped potential, um, I can assure you. Um, you, can, you can find some, something to do with EU funds. Um, so again, set up a meeting with us and we would be able to guide you further and go into more detail on each of these funding strands. Uh, you don't even have to have an idea, a project idea. You can come to us and uh, based on what you are as an organization and based on what is available, we can help you come up with a project ourselves. Any further questions? That's it from my end for now. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions with what we've covered so far. Um, but I guess you can just continue and then if, if anyone has any questions, they can. Uh, so uh, the next section is using call terminology. Um, here, we're going to go into a couple of um, uh, terminology, some, some jargon and explaining how you should use it to your advantage because it is not simply a matter of understanding what the program guide what um, eu funds want from you it's also a question of um, showing the evaluator the person who reads your application that you know what is expected from you um, and you can do so by by referring to this terminology so first of all and very very important um, funding program versus funding strength I myself have been referring to these two terms, if you've noticed throughout the, the uh, presentation. The funding program is basically the fund, the general fund uh, that you would receive the grant from. Um, so for example, Erasmus Plus is a funding program. Now, funding programs are very, very vast. So let's say, for example, Erasmus Plus covers sports, youth, education, and training. Um, already you can uh, tell that there are a lot of priorities going on there, a lot of different um, different things that you can do um, in terms of those four broad um, topics. So what they do is they section the funding program into um, a lot of funding strands. So um, each funding strand is more, um, more specific. And uh, th this is the, what you should actually look, look at when it comes to eligibility. When it this is the funding strand will tell you what your project needs to be. So for example, youth exchanges are one of the funding strands and the VET uh, mobility project that I just described, that's another funding strand. So when, if the application um, asks you um, how your project relates to the priorities of the funding strand, make sure to refer to the priorities of the funding strand. And if it asks you for the pri if, uh, how it relates to the priorities of the funding program, relate to the funding program, because they are, um, not um, they are not the same thing 100%. Um, next is the eligibility criteria and the award criteria. Um, Mauro from MCVS referred to these two terms um, already. Um, just to again um, emphasize, the eligibility criteria are the minimum conditions that your project must respect to be eligible in the first place. So if you do not respect the eligibility criteria, your application will not even be read. You will receive a letter that um, the application was completely rejected. 
So um, an example of eligibility criteria are the eligible applicants. So, and here, most of the organ most of the programs that I mentioned, most of the funding strands I mentioned, you would need to be a registered VO. So if you're not a VO, um, that decreases the, um, the opportunities you have. So again, to continue on what um, Maura said from Maura said, do make sure you are compliant, do make sure you register if you've never uh, registered as a VO. Um, another example of an LGBT criteria is, for example, the project partnership. If you do not have the required amount of partners, again, automatic rejection will not even be considered. Next is the award criteria. This is the basis on which the, the quality then of your project is assessed. So you've uh, passed the eligibility criteria stage, the eligibility assessment. Now, um, this is where the evaluator compares your project with all the other um, projects that they received on, in that particular deadline and, make and um, they grade you um, based on a predefined and pre-established list of award criteria. The award criteria is always accessible. It will always be in the program guide. They will also tell you the, the marks allocated to each award criteria. So it is very transparent and do make sure to, to read through them so that you know what the evaluator will be looking at and to also see the amount of marks because if a particular uh, section has a particular concern, a particular criteria has a lot of marks, that's what you need to focus on when you develop your project to make sure that particular element of your project is as strong as can be. An example of a word criteria, for example, is cost effectiveness. So if your project um, is um, claiming 10,000 euros uh, um, to reach 20 participants, but another organization with the same money will reach double the participants that has a higher impact and at a more cost effective um, rate. So obviously they would receive higher marks when it comes to cost effectiveness. Um, lastly, another jargon that you may want to use uh, to your advantage is the grant agreement. So this is the legal document that you sign um, if you are successful in your application. Um, this is the legal document you sign with the managing authority that actually gives you the, the fund, that actually gives you the grant. This is when you, you go from being an applicant to officially becoming a beneficiary of EU funding. Before you sign this grant agreement, you cannot um, actually start spending the, the money of the grant. Um, so very important. And also a way to, to show that you are aware of these sort of uh, details when it comes to writing your application. Instead of writing, for example, um, after the project starts, we will start um, the social media campaign. Instead, instead you can say, um, as soon as we sign the grant agreement, we will be uh, starting the social media campaign. Immediately that shows the evaluator that you um, are aware that there is a grant agreement to be signed and therefore you have done your homework, you have done your research into what is expected from you as a, a potential beneficiary. Um, so that was a very sh short, short section. Um, any uh, questions? No, uh, th this is when we'll actually start the writing process. So um, probably you will have a bit more questions when it comes to here. Um, this is now I'm going to go into what actually makes an application and how you should go about in answering the questions set by the application. Now, keep in mind, um, applications vary from one funding program to another. Uh, that being said, Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps are a bit similar, even in terms of what the application looks like. Um, and they tend to have um, a similar, similarly structured um, application form. And there are uh, a number of common elements, common questions that these applications tend to ask. Um, what you should keep in mind is, and what most people don't actually realize, when an application does not get EU funding, it may not be necessarily the case that your project was not good enough, that your idea wasn't um, effective, wasn't um, a good project um, to, to propose. Often, um, it can be that you didn't understand what the application was asking from you, um, so you uh, wrote your application incorrectly. Maybe you skipped over a question because you didn't realize um, it was there. Maybe you provided information in the incorrect sections. Um, so the evaluator marked you down for that. Um, 
basically it is um, the assim similar thing to doing a, a normal assignment. You must understand what the question is asking you to do. Now, um, the first, typically the first question that is asked is an, in relation to the participating organizations, both yourself um, as the applicant and your partners. And here, a common mistake that I that I often see when I um, uh, observe other other application other applications is that um, organizations can fall into the trap of simply saying, "I know how to." Or, um, introduce my organization. We have a two-pager document already in place that we send out or we have on our website. So I'm simply going to copy and paste that information into this section and it's done. It's not the case. Take the time to read the questions of, of this section because um, there will be a number of questions typically. Um, if, it asks, if it asks you the history of your organization, don't go into um, what you um, and any other thing besides the history, for example, and in your regular activities, be smart when you're describing what you do as an organization. Maybe the project that you're proposing, you've never done it um, before. Maybe you've never done it um, in this particular format, but you would probably have experience in um, some of the elements that um, is included in the in the activity of the of the project. So if your project includes, for example, a social media campaign, you should emphasize that you regularly carry out um, social media campaigns um, as part of your other initiatives. If you've done um, national events, you should emphasize that you're uh, therefore knowledgeable when it comes to logistics, when it comes to project management. So make, a, make sure that even if you do not have EU funding experience, um, make sure to structure your regular activities in a way that is relevant to the project you're proposing. Then uh, they will also ask you to provide past EU funding experience if you have it. If you don't, it's, it will not necessarily count against you. So it's not the case that someone, that preference is um, necessarily given to someone with more EU funding experience. It is always, the, it's always based on the quality of the project um, that you propose. Um, and also refer to the key persons involved. So um, do refer that you have these four particular persons writing the application and who will be implementing the project. And here, what I would like to draw your attention to is that at least when I was in student organizations, there was this tendency that we uh, wanted to almost hide the fact that we were students, that we were um, uh, youths, that we were 18, 19, 20 year olds um, who were uh, applying to carry out a national project. So we wanted to make ourselves look as professional, as adult, as much as we could. Um, don't do this um, when it comes to these to these particular funding programs. They are meant for youth, so they want to see the fact that you are that you're young, that you're students, that you are a student organization. So, for example, you can do this by referring to the age of of the people, by referring to the fact um, that they're studying a particular course. Um, so, do emphasize the fact that um, you are um, youths because that is what they're uh, ultimately looking for when it comes to these to Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps. Next is the project description. Um, this, I would say, is perhaps the most important section. Here is where your uh, evaluator, the person reading your application, th this is where um, that this person will start to understand what your project is. So in this section, first of all, you will want to give them a holistic overview of what the project is and all its different elements. So. Um, uh, if you have seven activities, make sure to at least provide one line or um, just in bullet form what your activities will going to be, for example. And apart from this, um, in terms of your project description, think of it as a way of justifying why your project should be funded um, and needs analysis of sorts. Um, basically, keep in mind that this is uh, public money. So, um, what the evaluator is thinking is, why should the EU invest in this project? Why should um, public money be given to you? So here you will need to show them that, listen, there's this problem. We've identified it and uh, we've, we know it's a problem because we have found these statistics, because um, there's anecdotal evidence uh, in, in our day-to-day -day work. Um, youths are constantly telling us uh, that it's a problem or we're seeing that our members don't have the, the competences that they uh, need. Apart from that, um, you can also refer to national or EU policies 
and also to the core priorities of the program that you're applying for. Um, so that is how you can justify that your application, uh, that your project is needed. And um, you should source here. So um, it's not uh, the case that you will be um, called for plagiarizing if you copy and paste, but still source the, the, the source where you're getting it from, um, because as always, it will strengthen your argument um, further. Now, um, the aims and objectives of a project. This is typically also asked in the project description section. And these two terms, um, you may think that they're the same or you would use them interchangeably, but they are distinct, um, although related. So the aim is the overall target that you want to achieve through the project. This is very broad and very, um, very vague in, in, in a sense, because for example, a name can be, I want to raise awareness about climate change. As you can see, I'm not telling you what I'm actually going to be doing. I just want, I want to tell you what I want to achieve um, in general. Then the objectives is where you actually tell the evaluator what you will be doing. So these are specific measurable targets that you will achieve through the project. Um, so for example, if the aim is to raise awareness about climate change, your objective can be that you will hold three debates about climate change for 50 university students. Um, as you can see, um, something uh, I took care to include in the example, um, it's, it's um, measurable. It, there's numbers there that you will be able to, to prove um, that you've reached your objective um, because uh, your aim for you can't really prove that you've reached it. I mean, how can you quantify raising awareness? But you can quantify that you held three debates. You can quantify that you held, that you organize one social media campaign. So your objectives need to be um, quantifiable. And also keep in mind, you can have multiple objectives, but typically you have one aim. So uh, your objectives are just a way to, to get um, to achieve your aims. Uh, next are three also um, related terms that can be um, confusing if you don't know the distinctions, participants, target groups, and stakeholders. So participants are those individuals who will participate directly in activities. Um, these must be selected. Um, ideally, they are known at application stage, but if not, you should um, explain in detail how you will be selecting participants. Um, so for example, the, the 50 students that participate in a debate, those will be your participants. Um, something I very commonly see is that uh, you include um, the people, the, the policymakers, the experts who are going to be present at the, in the debates as participants. This is not the case. Participants then are the youths, in your case, who are going to participate in the activities. Um, target groups include also a target audience uh, for dissemination, for promotion activities. So if you're raising awareness and you're holding debates and um, also a social media campaign, um, the, the audience for the social media campaign would be a target group. So the wider university and youth community can be a target group. Um, stakeholders then are those people, those subgroups who um, regardless of their involvement, so whether they were present in the project or not, they stand to benefit from the project results. So um, the most typical stakeholder that uh, I see in youth projects are policymakers. So when you present um, the results of a project to a policymaker, those policymakers are stakeholders in, in that project. Uh, next is the activities section of the application. When it comes to Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps, the way um, this section is set up is uh, first, it asks you to write a, a short description of the activity. Now, keep in mind, it's, it's, this will be either um, a description, a 5,000 character limit question on all the activities. So you will be need to be brief and to the point while still giving all the necessary information. Or uh, it may be the case that the application you're applying for allows you to describe each individual activity. Um, now, an, an activity is a, typically a tangible, a physical event. And uh, you can see this because um, in the screenshot here, you can see the, the flow. The flow is basically the, the mobility, the, the describing who will participate in an activity, where it will take place, the dates. So you input all these uh, details. As you can see, there's not even an option to write anything in. These are all uh, drop-down menus and numerical fields. So 
um, you simply input them in and then um, uh, later it will calculate the, the budget based on what you input into the flows. Um, in some cases, for for example, in key action three and um, and in youth exchanges, you may be asked to provide a detailed program of activities. So, um, for example, you would need to input this to, to fill in this template here. And this is where you describe in a bit more detail what you will be doing on a day by day uh, basis. You do not necessarily need to provide an hourly breakdown of activities. So that's not the case. And um, obviously, the evaluator understands that changes will, will take place um, uh, the closer you get to the activity. But you should be able to tell them we will be having these two activities in the morning and these two activities in the evening and describe what the activity will be and the methodology. So it's a workshop, it's a debate, it's a group discussion, these sort of considerations. Um, as I said uh, previously, then the budget is calculated completely automatically. You do not need to do anything um, besides input the details in the activity section. So uh, you see here a screenshot of what the budget summary looks like. Um, any questions? We've reached sort of the, the middle point here of the, the project writing uh, section. We don't have any questions. All right. Um, next uh, is the results and impact section. Um, here, these again are two um, interrelated concepts that are at the same time distinct. So make sure that you do not uh, confuse them. So um, results, they are linked to your objectives. So here, these are tangible and measurable achievements um, that you um, will be able to prove that you've, show, that you've um, managed to do in your project. So for example, 50 youths um, participate in debates on best measures to combat climate change. That is a result of your project. Um, an easy way to do this, take your objectives, um, you would have three, maybe four objectives, and rephrase them in a way that uh, reflect a result instead of an objective. So that will uh, ensure that you do not invent a result that you did not show um, how you will be reaching it in, in previous sections of the application. And the impact, on the other hand, reflect the aims, so it is more intangible and widespread. And it is more difficult to, to quantify, um, to show that you've actually uh, led to, to, to this impact. So for example, increased awareness on environmental issues. Um, your participants may improve their debating or critical thinking skills. Um, they may improve um, some specific competences. These sort of things are, are impacts. Um, the impact is quite important when it comes to writing an application. So do make sure that it is um, quite a beefed up section, so don't leave it um, uh, brief. Make sure that you explain um, what impact your project will, will have, because ultimately, as I said before, um, you're, you're being given public money to have this impact. So you need to justify, you need to show your evaluator that you uh, will be having some sort of good impact on the community um, through your project. Uh, next is the division of tasks among organizations. So as this is um, the case if you have a partnership in, in your project. So if, you're, if you have a national or a national project, um, you will probably not have this section. Here, um, a, a tip that I, uh, I would recommend uh, in this section is to, um, to, section, to structure your project around the strengths of the participating organizations. Um, if, your, if your organization is uh, quite um, knowledgeable in reaching policymakers, for example, or it has um, quite an established follower count on social media, therefore you're more experienced in, in uh, public awareness campaigns, then you should take those, those roles in the project and if your partner is more experienced in, for example, the design or creative content, you would leave the, 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 the output, the digital, the visual output to your organization because they're more experienced with it. And you explain in the application that this is how you've reached the conclusion um, of what, what uh, organization will be doing what in the project. 
So account for experience, expertise, the resources that the different organizations have, and explain to the evaluator um, this, this reasoning. Um, besides this, you will also need to tell them um, who will be taking care of specific project management uh, details and the organization of activities. So um, this you should keep in mind that you will need to discuss it with your uh, partner. You cannot simply invent roles and um, impose responsibilities on your partner without um, discussing with them if they're comfortable, if they're able to, to do these tasks. Next is monitoring and evaluation. This is also asked um, in the application form and again, two different um, concepts. Monitoring is something that you will automatically do. Um, you, will, you will not even um, realize that you're doing it because if you're doing a project, then you have to monitor. It's when you check that the project is being implemented correctly as you go along um, constantly. So this is an ongoing process. Um, making sure that you're on schedule, making sure that you're um, not going over the, the budget that you planned. Um, and also um, you're monitoring the participants um, the way uh, the way they're, they're proceeding in the project. So if uh, you have participants who um, your project relates to them going abroad, you are monitoring them when they are doing the, the activity abroad. Um, to make sure that they are actually getting what they what they expected from from the project next is the evaluation now this can be an ongoing process but in particular it should be carried out at the end of either uh, an activity or the end of the project to assess the success of the project um, the, the success of the project in reaching its ob objectives so typically obviously you do this through an evaluation form um, through one-on-one -on -one discussions with your participants. Um, you will need to show the evaluator that you already um, have a plan when it comes to monitoring, when it comes to evaluation, um, to, uh, to, to explain that you will be having, for example, monthly meetings to evaluate the project and to monitor the project as it goes along. These sort of things show the evaluator that you know what is expected from you at implementation stage and uh, you will be carrying out these, these uh, measures to make sure that your project is implemented successfully. The EU added value and sustainability. EU added value is um, quite a vague concept because you will never find um, it defined in any particular program guide um, as, a, as a holistic concept, but typically um, evaluators and the application will ask you what impact, what value um, your project has for the EU. Um, you can show this, for example, by showing that your project is contributing to EU policies um, and legislation and priorities. So if it's relating to the environment, uh, refer to the EU Green Deal, for example. Um, if your project relates to youths, refer to the EU youth strategy, these sort of things. Um, so even if it is a strictly national project, um, uh, you, you may think, uh, what does, what would the EU gain from a project that is strictly within the University of Malta? It would still be contributing to EU policies and EU initiatives, and therefore um, it can have EU value in that sense. Um, replicability and transferability. Uh, replicability basically means whether your project can be replicated, can be um, done uh, outside of Malta in, in the, the rest of the EU. So um, if you've designed a completely new uh, project um, idea and you are able to share your project with, uh, with your European network um, and tell them, listen, we did this project and it was successful, why don't you try it out in your other country and in, in your specific countries? That's a way of showing that you're, you're looking for replicability for your project. Um, transferability, on the other hand, is whether specific results of your project can be transferred to other um, EU countries. So if your project um, involved creating some sort of manual of procedures, for example, or a lesson plan or um, a workshop plan, um, and they can be transferred to other organizations abroad who can do them themselves in their own countries, then your project has EU added value in that sense. Um, obviously, the most obvious way of showing EU value is if the project should be carried out transnationally. So if the project is made stronger by the fact that you have a partner um, from another EU or program country on board, 
um, then you can show that uh, you have EU added value in that sense. Now, sustainability, as the name implies, is the continuation of the project um, in terms of its impact and results after um, the project ends and after uh, you stop receiving money um, for it. So, for example, um, something that is that, that boosts your sustainability is if you have a train the trainer approach um, to, to a project. So let's say um, you're doing a VET mobility project, you've sent um, two, three members of your exec board to, to Italy for training at a company or at another NGO. When those three people come back um, and the project ends, they will um, give the, the same training that they received um, to, to incoming members, to, your, to the next board, to um, more members of the board or to members of your organization. And that is a way to ensure the sustainability of your project even after the project ends. Um, three important terms, dissemination, exploitation, visibility. Dissemination is something very important at the, and that you must do. These are promotion activities of the project in general. Um, the fact that it is EU funded, um, its results, its activities, and you are obliged to do this um, because the, the application will specifically ask you, ask you what your dissemination strategy is. So, for example, the most easy way to carry out a dissemination um, strategy is through social media uh, because it's, it's easy and it's free and it has a high impact. Exploitation is a step further than dissemination and it's, it's not necessarily the case that every project will have an exploitation um, element because an exploit, uh, exploitation when it comes to EU funds means that um, you will teach target groups how to use the results of a project. So this can only be done if your project resulted in some sort of tangible output. So let's say um, you, you, um, you did a lesson plan um, with coordinating with um, a country, with a, an NGO abroad, and you come up with a, a lesson plan or with a workshop plan um, or a manual of procedures that you then want to uh, teach other target groups how to use them. Either you carry out an online workshop, for example, and take them through the, the manual of procedures. You, ca you can organize a webinar, you can organize a, a physical event. Um, these are ways to exploit the results of your project. Um, visibility is, again, something you have to do. It's an obligation to use the relevant EU logos and texts um, to show that you received EU funds for this particular project. We're all familiar with these logos. Um, they're basically everywhere and you would need to use them um, on any project material. So if you print um, some merchandise to use during Freshers Week um, from the project budget, you would need to have the logo of the of Erasmus Plus, for example, of UPA, and if you have it, the logo of the project. So that's um, how you adhere to the visibility requirements. Lastly, um, a pro an application will always ask, ask you to, um, to provide a summary. And here, uh, what I would recommend is simply to copy and paste from the rest of your application. So you ensure that you don't introduce anything new from, uh, from what you've already said um, by copying and pasting. Um, something you should also keep in mind is that it, the question will never be phrased and uh, simply uh, provide a summary of your project. It will always ask you to provide um, specific elements. So. Um, it will ask you to give the aim, the objectives, the activities of the project. So make sure to read this question carefully and ensure that you've uh, covered each element that is asked in this question. And don't skip over anything because it, it may um, affect the, the mark you receive from, from uh, the evaluator. Uh, we've come to the end of the project application writing um, itself. Uh, next are just uh, some tips um, for, for a good application. Um, so do you have any questions on this section? I don't think that there are any questions. Um, again, um, you can always feel free to contact us if you are writing an application and uh, come up with some sort of difficulty. Um, so that's uh, something you can keep in mind. 
Um, as I said, some useful tips to keep in mind. So first thing, and it may sound obvious, is to keep track of the project details by being organized. So um, when you're writing an application, you will start having a lot of documents. So the application itself, um, some attachments like declaration of honor, um, the mandate form signed by the partners, um, the guidelines, um, you, you would have the project brief and the information provided that by the partners. Do keep them in one specific folder that you can easily access because as you're writing the application, um, you may uh, forget, for example, the number of students that you're going to be targeting. So it's very easy to click on the final project brief and uh, check the, the specifications of your project. Um, and this way it will facilitate the process and make it faster. Um, the second is to accommodate for your own writing style. Um, there is no correct way to write an application. Um, so some people like myself, I prefer to start an application from beginning to, to end and work chronologically. Um, others uh, prefer to, to um, do um, the questions as they prefer. So they may start from the impact section towards the end and then they move on to activities. So feel free to work um, the, accommodate, the, the application in the way that is easiest for you. Um, and also, um, for example, another way to accommodate for your own writing style is um, whether you write in the first person or the third person. I, again, personally prefer to write um, when I'm writing an application, I always use we, uh, we are going to do this, we are going to do that. But um, uh, I know that some other people prefer to use the organization will carry out um, X, Y, Z. So again, accommodate for the way that you prefer. Um, there is no right or wrong way to, to do it. This is very important. Do not refer to ineligible activities. And often this can be um, a case of simply um, taking it for granted that um, a word means what you think it does. When it comes to EU funds, um, there are there is the issue of interpretation and uh, the issue of eligibility. So to give a very, um, a very practical example, I mentioned the VET mobility projects. And here you can only um, carry out job shadowing, at least in the current program, you could only carry out job shadowing activities. So um, we had cases where the the evaluator thought the application was not correct because um, the, the applicant referred to training. The evaluator considered training to refer to a structured training course. Um, the applicant thought that, uh, job sh that because you're doing job shadowing, obviously you're receiving training. Um, you're receiving training through job shadowing. But because the, this person referred to an ineligible activity, um, it was it was a red flag for the evaluator, and the evaluator thought that um, the the applicant was referring to something that was not eligible. So my recommendation here is open up the program guide. It will have a, a section eligible activities. Um, look at what the words and the terminology the program guide uses, and do not uh, stray from those uh, words. Um, another example, for example, uh, of using something that is ineligible and very typical in your case, you may refer to young adults. An evaluator sees the word adults and says, um, this is a youth project. Um, you cannot have adults in your project and uh, considers you ineligible because of that. So if the program guide uses the word youths, then stick to youths or students if you prefer. Um, another tip is to factor your partners into the writing process. It's quite easy to um, just simply write your application yourselves and then sending the final um, application to them to just read it through. But keep in mind that first of all, this has to be a collaboration. So do take into their feedback on board um, because ultimately they may know things, um, they may have expertise and resources that you don't. So, so you would want to um, include that into your application. Uh, moreover, you will need information from them about their organization, for example, so factor in the time you would need to get that information because um, to, to get that, that information, you may need to run after them, you may need to send reminder emails, and it will take um, um, some time, so do not leave this to the last minute. Um, Apart from this, and also on the topic of partners, very, very easy um, to overlook is 
to when you check your partner's information. Um, do not simply copy and paste the information that they provide you um, on a Word document into the application because uh, we see this quite often. Um, your or, uh, odds are that your partner organizations are not native English speakers or they are not familiar with writing in English. So um, they may either not have understood the question in the participating organization section. They may have skipped over something. For example, they may not have provided you with the names and details of the participating of the persons involved in the application. Um, so do check the, that their answers are grammatically correct, that they've um, ticked every box that they need to tick. And also something that you should also check is when you input the details of your organization, certain fields are automatically filled in into the application because it's linked to the EU login account. Um, we've had cases where, for example, when the NGO in question was um, setting up the account, um, they accidentally ticked that they were a public, um, a public organization, not an NGO. And this is something that you cannot change because it's an automatic field. So what they would need to do is go into their account and change these details. And obviously this takes some time. And if you do not check it, um, it may be the case that, for example, a public entity is not eligible for, for this uh, particular pr uh, project that you're applying for. And even though they're NGO, they mistakenly ticked that they are a public entity and you would be disqualified just because of a, of a mistake when they were doing their, their, applica their, uh, their application, essentially. Um, tip number six, and very important, do not assume that the evaluator has the same expertise as you. Um, the, the evaluator will be someone who is familiar with the youth field, yes, granted, but um, you may uh, have an evaluator that has no idea about the environment, for example, and you're proposing a project in relation to the environment. So you've used jargon, you've assumed that the evaluator understands what, a, what um, an, an urgent problem um, environmental degradation is. So you didn't actually um, go into the details of justifying your, your project because you assumed that your evaluator will understand that evaluator, ev environmental degradation is a problem. Never assume anything. Um, the evaluator, um, just assume that the evaluator has no idea what you're talking about at any point. So you should also always explain. Um, you should always take into consideration that they may not be familiar with certain um, um, phrases, with certain acronyms. So always explain acronyms in full the first time you use them. Um, a good way to, to, um, to mitigate this assumption um, is to ask someone external to your, um, to your project or ideally someone external from your organization in itself to give your application uh, a read-through. So after you've finished it, because you've been uh, working on this um, application for weeks, maybe even months, you may start taking certain things for granted. You may assume that the, the activities are well explained, that it is easy for the, the person reading, reading it to understand what the project is. Um, but when someone externally reads it, they may tell you, may tell you listen, I have, uh, I'm not really clear on what you're aiming to do through this, through this um, particular activity. So this is something that uh, really helps you when it comes to, to uh, submitting a, a competitive application. Again, MUSIC does provide this, this service of reading, uh, vetting your application after it is finalized. Um, this brings me to the, towards the end. So if you have any questions, um, this I think is the final question time allocated for the presentation. Please feel free to ask any questions um, with regards to anything which has been tackled, or maybe if you have a question which is on your mind and it hasn't been tackled in this, in this information session, although it was very informative. We don't seem to have any questions. Um. Just um, as a final um, input from me, um, you will be receiving um, an email from KSU on our behalf. You will be receiving the notes pack um, that we've prepared prior to the, to the presentation, the sample application form that I explained um, in the beginning of the, the project of the presentation. As a reminder, this is a completely fake application form. Do not fill in this, do not think that this is the application form that you will need to fill in. 
Um, this is simply an, an example, um, a short and condensed example of what a good application looks like. You will also be receiving an evaluation form uh, with regards to uh, this presentation. And um, here are our contact details. Uh, if you want to take a note um, of our offices in both Malta and Gozo, our uh, email is info.music at gov.mt. You can also contact us through our uh, website or social media. So that uh, brings me to the end here. Um, unless there are any questions, um, then we can stop here. Um, almost right on time. So that's it's almost good that there were no questions in a sense. Um, if there aren't any questions, I think that we can, we can stop here. As you said, um, thank you, Rebecca, for first of all, accepting our invitation and for conducting this presentation. Um, I think that was very informative. Please um, do not hesitate to contact either me if you need any, any other details and I will pass you on to Rebecca myself or you can contact um, music directly um, if you encounter any issues or if you'd like more information or more details about anything that, that you will be working on. Uh, I hope that you found this session um, interesting and that it gave you a lot of information which is useful to you in, in um, organizing your, your projects and, and events and in hopefully applying and being su successful in applying for funds. Um, uh, as, as Rebecca said, we'll be obviously um, we'll be disseminating the, the notes and, and the, 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 the application form, which is a draft application form and, and just a, a sort of an example and the, the evaluation form. And if you have any other questions which come up um, after the event, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you.